Jeff Gerwich here for DefenseReview.com, and welcome to another episode of The Build. This is a series where I cover a specific AR, how it's put together, and what it's used for. In this episode, I'll be covering this clone of my last deployment gun, which I used during my last combat tour in Afghanistan back in 2015. So let's go. Okay, now before I go over covering this exact clone, let me explain a little bit how I got from a basic M4 to this during my three deployments in Afghanistan. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to go in depth into it, that would just be too long. You can actually see that my progression from each tour in my competition to combat accessory articles on defensereview.com. I'm currently up to a part four, but the first three parts discuss how I went from a you know M4 with block two accessories to a Mark 18, and then finally to this setup right here. And really the key thing is in Afghanistan, the enemy likes to use terrain and distance when fighting US forces. And more often than not, the most likely weapon that US forces are going to encounter is a PK machine gun or a PKM. And that's a belt fed machine gun. It's uh, very accurate in the right hands. And I experienced, you know, being shot at by it almost every firefight that I was in and at distances between 500 and 700 yards. So in Afghanistan, you really need to have a rifle set up, giving you the best capability at engaging targets at these distances. Now, an M4 and 5.56 is really not the best long-range platform, but if you, uh, you rig it up right with the right accessories and you know what you're doing and you have the right ammo, you can actually be pretty effective at you know, suppressing and engaging targets at least out to 500 yards. All right, so let's go over my SoftMod Block 2 clone. Now, starting at the front, I have a Surefire four-prong flash hider. It is pinned and welded to this Colt Socom M4 heavy profile barrel. This is a Daniel Defense RIS-2, the front sight post version rail. Underneath that is a Magpul AFG with Magpul rail covers. On top, I have a Trichicon VCOG 1-6 with a 55 grain BDC. Underneath that is a Dr. Sight and a Matt Burkett Predator offset mount. This bad boy's got three tours on it. Underneath that is a Ready Mag Gen 1 extended bolt catch, Arredondo extended magwell, a BCM gunfighter grip, and a Arc Defense buttstock. The charging handle is a Raptor charging handle, and the trigger is a JP. Now I know the uh, SOCOM guns were issued Geisley Super Select Fires, but performance-wise, you know, this trigger feels about the same and it performs the same. All right, one thing I'd like to point out with this clone, uh, this is not a Colt gun. Now I know clone purists will be like, well, it's not a Colt, so it's not a true you know, military type clone. Shame. Well, that may be true. Uh, it does perform exactly like my last issue duty gun, and that's what I was going for. The lower is actually an Adam's Arms lower, and this is a Smith & Wesson upper. But again, this performs and has all the accessories I used you know, downrange. In fact, all these accessories have multiple tours on them. Uh, this VCOG has one tour, but all these other accessories have at least uh, two tours in Afghanistan. And this Arredondo extended magazine well uh, had all three tours in Afghanistan, and I even used it on one tour in Iraq back in the mid 2000s. So being made out of plastic, you know, this thing's proven indestructible. Now I started my 2015 tour with a Mark 18 with a Trichicon VCOG. 1 to 6, uh, only because I'd used it the previous deployment on Mark 18, and it served me pretty well. The longest shot I made in my second tour is about 500 yards, or that's the longest I had engaged the enemy at. And with an Elkan sight, uh, you're able to hit if you know what you're doing. So my 2015 tour, I started with that same Mark 18, and I ran it suppressed, except this time I put on the VCOG just to give me more magnification, not to increase the range, but to really give me the best advantage at hitting, you know, a target between five, 600 meters. It was after my first firefight that, you know, that I realized, you know, a shorty Mark 18 is not doing the BDC in a VCOG any justice at all. And it was after that first engagement I had on the ground that I went to this full uh, 14 and a half inch, you know, M4A1 upper. Oh, 
All right, now I want to cover the particulars of uh, why I chose all these different accessories. So let me get into that right now. Now this Daniel Defense RIS-2 rail, uh, a funny story about this. You know, SOCOM was trying it back in 2008, 2009. I believe it was going through trials. That's when I first heard of it. Uh, and I think it started being issued around 2010. Uh, I actually did not get issued a RIS-2 rail till my 2014 tour. And by 2015, my second tour, we actually got issued the newer RIS-2 non-front sight post version uh, halfway through my deployment. But since I already had this mounted up and zeroed, really, I just stuck with it. So that's just, you know, a little insight to how long it actually takes gear and special forces to reach all the different teams. Now, this AFG really just depends on the weight and the feel of the gun, whether I like a, you know, a vertical grip or an angled foregrip. Typically, with a shorter type gun like a Mark 18, I like the vertical foregrip. But for a longer gun, I do like the feel of an AFG. It just, again, it feels just a better balance for me. Now, I already mentioned the Aerodono Extended Magwell. And really, I don't think you can go wrong with these. Uh, again, it's plastic, but it's indestructible. And the key thing with this is it allows you to reload without even, you know, trying to see your magazine well at all. And a lot of people will say, well, I really don't need it. True, but it does enhance one's performance in a reload, especially when you're moving at night, you know, under nods with a group of, uh, with a team. You don't have time to get that quick, you know, picture at the magazine well, really. You know, you can load by feel without even looking at it, slap it, and you're good to go. So that's why I really like this extended magazine well. Now, this next item right here, this uh, Ready Mag Bolt Catch, I get a lot of questions about, uh, mainly like, what is it? This is actually from a Gen 1 Ready Mag system, and I believe the Gen 2 is a little bit smaller. You, I don't think you can find these longer Gen 1 bolt catches anymore. And the reason why I use this is mainly because I'm a lefty. And trying to find the bolt catch on a normal AR uh, with just, you know, my index finger can be a little tough, especially, again, when I'm moving at night. So this Ready Mag extended bolt catch allows me to really just slap the side of the gun uh, and it chambers. Or I can actually just lift up and push up with my finger and it chambers the bolt. So that's why I really like this Ready Mag. Now, this uh, Raptor charging handle, I actually only ran it my third tour. My previous tours, I was running a BCM gunfighter, but the edges on the BCM gunfighter are a little bit rough, a little bit sharp, so I found this Raptor a little bit smoother. Again, because I'm lefty, my sport hand is actually my right hand, so I need something on the right side of the gun to be able to rack the bolt. The Arc Defense buttstock actually comes standard, or it did come standard for quite some time on Adam's Arms rifles. And I was a member of the Adams Arms shooting team and a brand, uh, brand ambassador for about 10 years with Adams Arms. Hence, that's why I have an Adams Arms lower. I got a bunch of Adams Arms guns laying around. This Arc Defense buttstock, uh, really, I find, has the best, you know, cheek to stock. So when it comes to mounting the gun, I think it's the most positive, and that's why I really like it. Again, the more and the better contact you have with your buttstock, the more accurate you can be with long-range shots. And again, this gun is primarily set up for long-range shooting. Okay, moving on, I have a BCM gunfighter grip, and really any aftermarket grip I find is an improvement over an A2 grip. They're just really dismal, and an A2 grip allows your hand to ride up too high. Of course, with these increased palm swells, uh, really, it puts your hand in the ultimate position to manipulate the trigger. Now, all the rifles I use have ambidextrous safeties, again, because I'm lefty. Now, on my issue gun, I ran a DPMS brand. Uh, ambidextrous safety only because that was an issued one which I got in the early 2000s during my Iraq tours. Now let me talk about this offset mount real quick. Now offset mounts are nothing new to the military. Typically uh, it's not offset, it's uh, piggyback mounts. Uh, I saw my first piggyback mounted optic was an ACOG in 2005. It had a doctor sight on top and that was an issued sight. And of course, in 2007, with the release of SoftMod Block 2, all LCANs come with a doctor's sight, now an EOTech MRDS mounted on top. But really, uh, mounted or piggyback optics, I think there's too much height above bore, and that creates two issues. One, of course, is you typically have to lift your head up off the buttstock slightly to find it, which is, again, not good cheek-to-stock contact. 
And secondly, because of the height above bore can be as much as four and a half inches, uh, that's just too much, you know, hold off. So if you're, you aim here with the red dot, four and a half inches can actually be below the heart and lung area and you might not get good hits. Uh, these offset mounts actually were born out of the competitive shooting world, uh, specifically three gun. I've been running this one since 2010 and really these offset mounts shine because one, they have a super low height above bore. This actually has a closer height above bore than an aim point. It's about 1.7 inches, but more importantly, you can maintain that cheek to stock. So here I am using my primary optic and to use the offset, I simply roll the gun over and that offset doctor sight is right there. So that's why they shine in three gun and they're really popular because of the speed in which you can employ them. And again, they have uh, way less height above bore. All right, now to talk about this VCOG. Now, the VCOG gets critiqued a lot because of its weight and its size, and really it's, it's going against the Vortex Razor. The reason why I chose the VCOG back in 2015 is really uh, basically because it has this integral mount and my experience with the military and the ACOG. You know, the ACOG has proven to be an indestructible four power scope. So when I was looking at, you know, six powers, which is all the only thing existed, eight powers were not out yet. You know, my choices were the Vortex Razor or the VCOG. And I chose the VCOG just because the integral mount and the or reputation of Trigicon products. Now, the reason why I went with a BDC is, is really speed in combat. It's true, mill type reticles are more accurate. Uh, you can really get it down to the ammo you use and your precise holds if you get your muzzle velocity. But really for in combat, you just don't have that time. And you know, you're going off of the exposure that the enemy gives you. So if a guy pops out at you know, two or 300 yards, how am I guessing it's two or 300 yards? Usually off my eye. And so I only have a split second to range them and the BDC is just a lot better or quicker method of getting that quick hold off. And really with practice, and once you get your exact holds for those ranges, uh, really, the BDC, I don't think it can be beat as far as speed. Now, this is the 55 grain reticle, and I ran Mark 262 77 grain the whole time down range in Afghanistan. But again, I wanted it for after deployment. I could use this in three gun competition. And again, really, it's just practicing and learning the holds with 77 grain, and it was actually you know fairly close. I actually ran this with 308 also, and you know the the range lines were within about 50 yards of, uh, you know, between 5.56 five, and 3.08. Now, my critiques of the VCOG, I don't mind the weight. Uh, this thing's proven indestructible. I've fallen numerous, numerous times in Afghanistan, and this scope has taken a beating and it's held zero. So, you know, it's held up to what I expected it to as far as abuse. My biggest critique really is it has a really small eye box. Uh, it's very limited uh, to about, what, two and a half inches, and really for the cost of this scope, I expected a little bit more forgiving eye box. In fact, the uh, Vortex, you know, Strike Eagle 1 to 8 that I own that I covered in episode 1, I actually I think has a more forgiving eye relief than this VCOG. But really, that's really my own, only complaint. Uh, it's a super sturdy scope, and as far as employing it, I ran it the whole time on 6 power in Afghanistan. Anything under 100 yards, I was going to rely on my Predator uh, mount with the doctor sight in there. But really, my last tour at the closest target, I think that uh, you know made itself available to me was around 200 yards. So I didn't engage anything close than that. I did have teammates that you know took point blank shots and, and some CQB distance shots. You know we're talking within 10 yards, and they had good effects. But you know targets, I just didn't get presented with any during my last tour. I did uh, plenty of shooting out two, three, and I think the longest shots I took were about 480. And this did the job pretty well. I'm very pleased with it. If I had to deploy again, I definitely would, uh, you know, I'd run this VCOG again, or I would look at the VCOG 1 to 8. Again, not to extend the range of this rifle. It's still only about a 650 meter gun, but that extra magnification, if I had an 8 power, would allow me, you know, better aiming and a better chance at hitting those shots, you know, within three, four, and 500 yards. All right, let me expand on the dual optic concept just a little bit more. You know, uh, I think 
2019 is the year of dual optics becoming the standard for soft operators' guns. If you look at photos downrange from Syria and Afghanistan, you know, I would say more than 50% of the guys are now running, you know, dual optic guns with some sort of offset red dot. And, you know, one could say, well, that's easy. These guys are in Afghanistan. They're shooting long range. But really, a dual optic gun is the best setup really for any type of mission. Because even if the mission might be CQB going to hit a building, well, what guys are finding in the military is, you know, on the way to that building, you could be in a long range gunfight. So if you're driving through a rural area, you could have three to 400 meter shots or even farther, you get to the target and now you're doing CQB point blank shooting, which a red dot shines. You go to the roof of that building, you might have to take shots at another building. Again, that, those can be long distance. And then you have to fight your way off target. So again, you're back to doing long range shooting. So in the course of one mission, you'd be going from, you know, long range to point blank range and then back to long range. So you need to have a, a gun set up. And I think dual optics is becoming the new standard, at least within special operations. Now online, a lot of people might refer to this as a recce setup. Uh, that term does not exist in special forces. We don't call these recce setups. Really, we would just call this, hey, this is my issued gun and I'm gonna set it up like this. So uh, the recce term, I think is actually maybe a Navy thing. But again, we don't use that term in special forces. Really this, again, would just be, hey, this is my duty gun for the day. Alright, that just about does it for this episode of the build. If you have any questions or comments about this build, my soft mod block 2, uh, please post them down below. Please subscribe to Defense Review's YouTube channel here. It's Def Rev. And like and share this video. I'm Jeff Gerwich. Thanks for watching.